Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, everyone, this is Mark Lazary. He is the co-owner of the Milwaukee Bucks basketball team, uh, as well as the uh, CEO of Avenue. Mark, thank you so much uh, for coming and for agreeing to do this. Uh, it really means so much to everyone that you're here uh, and taking time out of your busy schedule to help us learn. So before we get started on your time as the owner of the Bucks, uh, I thought it might be helpful if we got to learn a little bit more about you on a personal level. So can you please talk about your background and your upbringing before you became who you are today? Uh, and what steps did you take along your journey to get you here? <laughs> Hopefully that's better. Yeah, that's better. Um, thank you, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I have five kids, so uh, four of them came to Penn. And so it's, it's always a pleasure to come here. Um, so uh, I was born in Morocco and uh, in Marrakesh. And, you know, we came, uh, grew up in Hartford, Connecticut. We came here when I was seven. Um, went to, you know, college on scholarship, law school on scholarship, um, and sort of decided I'd be a lawyer, not because I was dying to be a lawyer. Um, I had one of those Jewish moms who sort of viewed that um, I either had to be a lawyer or a doctor. And even though I sort of had a different view, um, you know, because when you're young, you sort of think it's your life. Um, my mother explained to me that it wasn't my life um, and that I should, um, you know, I had to do law. So I practiced for about a year and got out and somehow got involved in the investment world. Um, I thought I'd be a physics teacher and um, I was pretty good with numbers. So when I... I was able to get involved in um, on the investment side. Um, things started working out. I guess that's a quick and dirty, or quick and quick way of describing my background. Amazing, thank you. So you mentioned that you moved uh, to Hartford, Connecticut, when you were seven years old, uh, meaning that you're first generation uh, first generation immigrant to the U.S. Uh, what do you remember about your early days in the in the U.S., like going through school and everything like that? Oh, it was, um, you know, it was a lot of fun. I mean, I think you, I loved sports. Um, you know, we had a very simple rule at our house. If you did well um, at school, you could do any sports, you could do anything. So my mom was pretty strict about things. Um, but, um, you know, when I was young, I thought I'd, um, I'd play in the NBA. And other than a lack of skill... Um, <laughs> <laughs> I could have gotten there. Um, but, you know, you play on your high school team. Um, I thought it was, you know, it was a very idyllic way to grow up. I mean, we um, I have two sisters, and, you know, I shared a room with them till I went to college. So um, you really, you either get really close or you hate your sisters. Um, you know, for my sister's my partner, so... Um, we ended up becoming uh, super close, and my other sister works for us also. So it's, um, it was fun. I mean, it was nice. And I went to Clark because I thought I could play basketball there. And I, I played for a couple of years and then realized um, I just wasn't that good, um, which is a horrible, uh, you know, when you come to realize you're just not that talented. Um, but, yeah, it was fun. Great. Um, so you also mentioned that you practiced law for about a year after college. Yeah. Uh, after you finished practicing, what were the first like few jobs uh, out of that, and what were some things that you learned early on in your career that have really helped you? Um, you, know, you quickly learn uh, life is difficult. I think it's... I went to work at... Um, I, was, I, I got hired as a lawyer at a small investment firm. And I went there, and um, that's how I got involved. I switched from law to investing. And I made the firm, uh, my first year, $25 million. So if you sort of think about it, it's, this is 86, 
80, yeah, around um, 86, 87. So imagine you make somebody, I was making 50,000 a year. So I make them 25 million and now bonus time comes, right? So you sort of are saying to yourself, um, what should I ask? You know, what, what would be fair? So what do you think is a fair number if you make somebody $25 million to ask for? It's supposed to be interactive. I'm sorry? Half. Half. Wow. <laughs> All right. So you I can never hire. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. Anybody more reasonable? <laughs> Uh, how much did I risk to make the $25 million? Um, risked about $50 million. So it wasn't a lot. So we did great. Um, anybody else? You'd say half also? Wow. I love you guys. Um, what did you say? 10%. Right. So you're more reasonable. You can come work at Avenue. Um, so I asked for... And, and I, I went through a lot to figure this out. I asked for a half of 1%. So I figured I made somebody $25 million. I thought 1% would be a lot because I was only making 50. So I asked for 125000 And, you know, you, you ask your dad, you ask your friends, and you go into the meeting and he goes, well, what would you like for a bonus? I said, well... I made you $25 million. I'd like uh, 125000 And I, I swear this happened. He, he gets up and he goes, Mark, that's utterly ridiculous. And he goes, we're giving you 10000 but you're doing a great job and we're really proud of you. You just keep it up. It's called an attaboy, right? Where <laughs> somebody puts their arm around you and goes, attaboy, you're doing great. And um, I remember I called my wife, and uh, she goes, so, so, how'd we do? I go, not that good. Uh, <laughs> um, we're not going to be able to buy that house. Uh, so <laughs> we, um, I left three months later. Uh, and sort of, you quickly find out, you know, at times just life isn't fair, right? And it's, it is what it is, and we all, you know, we all pay our dues, and we all do things. Um, and sort of that's how I ended up um, at a firm called Cowan and Company, which um, um, we know pretty well, and sort of worked there, um, and then left and joined the Bass Group, the Bass Brothers. Um, but I would never have gone to Cowan um, without sort of sort of going through what I did at, uh, at my previous firm. So. Can you explain like the difficulties of switching from firm to firm? Obviously, that takes a lot of courage um, to kind of just pick up and keep moving. What was kind of your driving passion to get to Cowan and then Bass and then eventually uh, starting your own investment firm? I think part of it is, look, it, it, you're all going to go there. You're all going to end up sort of, I think, you know, following your path. But what always ends up happening is um, we all think we're really smart, right? I mean, you're, you're here at Penn, you're at Wharton. We all think we're smart. And you end up, you know, what always ends up happening is you sort of look and say, okay, well, I've made somebody X. What should I get? I think if you feel you're getting paid fairly, you'll stay where you are. Right? And you'll grow with a firm if you think you're getting paid fairly. When you don't think you're getting paid fairly, um, you tend to look to leave um, and either join another firm or to go off on your own. I think for me, um, the only reason I left Cowan, I loved Cowan. I thought it was great. Um, I was, I had uh, at the time, we were running about, 50 million for the firm and the first year was 25 we did about 70 percent then the second year they gave us 50 and i met the bass family um gentleman david bonnerman and robert bass and you know they came and said look we'll give you 150 million if you can if you want to leave and we'll give you 20 percent of the profits um you know back then that was a huge number believe it or not 
when I joined Bass in 88, it, we were at 150 million, the largest fund in the world, in the distress fund in the world. Um, you know, today it's, that's one person or one institution giving you capital. Um, so that was the reason I left. I just thought it was a unique opportunity. And it, it was great. And I did that for a couple of years. And then um, you, I, we had done really well at Bass, about sort of 30% a year. And I decided when I was 30 that I just wanted to go off on my own and sort of started Avenue or Amrock. Um, and we ended up starting the firm uh, mainly just investing my own money. And that grew exponentially. We sort of doubled the money every year for about five years. And, um, you know, that's how we started Avenue. So it's just, I think part of it is you, you're where you are and you either feel like you're being treated fairly, and if you do, you want to stay, or you sort of have a desire to go off on your own. And, you know, just everybody you're going to meet and in sort of while you're a pen, you'll have all these speakers who come, and it's always a great story. The problem is there's also like 100 people where it didn't work out, right? So you got to remember it's not... It's not that easy because <laughs> you only meet the people where things have worked out. So it's, um, it's hard, but I think at the end of the day, you know, I would say you should always follow your dream and try you know, to be the best that you can be. But it's, um, it's, it's a difficult road. It's a fun road, but it's still a difficult road. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so like starting your own path at age 30 to create Avenue, uh, that's a scary thing. It's like a, yeah. a really risky uh, move to just become your own person. So can you speak on the process of founding uh, Avenue, your own investment firm, and can you elaborate on the firm's core values and strategies that you guys uh, pursue? Sure. It, it's hard. I mean, when we started Avenue, we started with about $7 million. And it was my capital and that of a few friends. And I know this sounds hokey, but part of the reason you'll succeed is because you're, for me, my wife was phenomenal. Um, you know, if your partner is supporting you, it makes it a lot easier because we had five kids under seven at the time. And I remember, you know, I was sort of saying, look, I'm going to do this. I hope it works. If it doesn't, you know, we're going to have to move back to Hartford, Connecticut. Um, you know, I'll be a lawyer. And you know, your partner's got to say, that's fine. Right? It's not. And sort of we started Avenue, and the idea was that, you know, we were going to try to do special situations, um, hire the people that we always wanted to work with. And so we did that. And the firm grew really exponentially. I think within five years, from when we started, we were running about a billion dollars. And then um, five years from there, we were running about $20 billion. Um, you know, and then we hit the crisis. Um, you know, so we lost a little money. You know, lost about 25% and then sort of made it back the following couple of years. But um, I think as, you, as a firm grows, you, you try to learn from all the mistakes or all the things you thought were wrong as you were sort of in the business. And I think for us, we sort of made a decision. Um, we wanted to be exceptionally moral, exceptionally ethical, um, and just hire people that we wanted to be friends with, as, um, as opposed to people who could make you money but are difficult. We were always trying to find people who hopefully could make you money and weren't as difficult. Um, so you mentioned uh, the 2008 recession and kind of dealing with that 25% uh, loss. Um, can you like walk us through one or other two moments in your career where you were just up against this difficulty and kind of how you learned from those experiences and what you like what you did to keep going and moving forward? You know, it's hard. I mean, you're you know the first thing you're taught while you're here at Penn or when you're investing is. You're always taught one simple thing, like, um, 
have confidence in what you're doing. And if you buy something and if it goes down, you should buy more, right? Average down. Um, it's really hard to do. Just trust me. It's, I remember in 2008, we started buying Ford bank debt. And you guys know Ford, right? Everybody knows Tesla. Hopefully you know Ford, right? <laughs> so if you sort of think of Ford, we started buying the bank debt at 80, 70, 60, 50. You know, it's not easy when you, we, we had close to half a billion dollars of Ford bank debt because we just kept buying it and it kept going down. So I remember, um, you know, the, our trader, you know, you sort of sit on the trading floor and our trader goes, hey, um, we have more Ford bank debt, uh, 50 million, it's being offered at 50. And, you know, the analyst and the PM are sitting next to me and we're talking about it and the analyst, I look at the analyst and he goes, absolutely, we should buy it. And I'm like, nothing personal, you've been dead wrong. <laughs> Every time you've told me to buy something, it's just gone down. And we've only lost like hundreds of millions of dollars on this thing. Um, I said, I don't want to buy it. And he looks at me and goes, look, Mark, you got to trust me on this. I go, I don't even like you. I don't, <laughs> well, why would I trust you? <laughs> and he goes, just trust me. And so I, I look at the trader. I go, listen, I got no interest in this anymore. Um, I, don't want to buy, I don't want to bid on it. And, you know, the trader goes, look, we're obligated to. Um, we... And I said, fine, just bid him 30. I don't care. I don't want to own it. And, you know, the analyst like, Mark, that, that's wrong. We should buy this maybe not at 50, 45. I'm like, I, I don't want to listen to you. I've lost hundreds of millions. The trader goes, thank you. And I look at the trader, I'm like, who are you thanking? And he goes, well, we just bought it at 30. I'm like, oh, my God. you got to understand. <laughs> That meant that that day we lost $100 million on that position, right? I mean, that's, you had to mark it down from 50 to 30. Mm-hmm. And we had $500 million, now we have 550 And I look at the analysts, and, you know, it's, you're just, you're mad because you're losing money. And we lost that year, I would say we lost about $5 billion dollars. You know, we're running like 20 billion, 22 billion. It's real money. You know, and you, you feel sick. Um, so I looked at the analyst and he goes, Mark, that's great news. We bought it at 30. I'm like, seriously? I'm firing you, just <laughs> so you know. You're not going to be here. And he goes, no, no, you're kidding, right? I was like, yes, I'm kidding. But it, it's really hard to sort of lose money and go through it and still believe in what you're doing. Because the market and everybody else is telling you you're wrong, right? So it's a very difficult environment. And um, we ended up, I mean, you know, so 2008, we lost 25. 2009, we made 66% because it sort of all came back. And Ford ended up going back to par. Um, And it's just... I, I think as you go through these things, um, you, you sort of realize you've got to believe in what you're doing, and either you're right or you're wrong. And if you're right, um, time will tell. And if you're wrong, same thing, time will tell. Um, but it's a difficult process. It's not that easy. Um, but I guess uh, we all learn from it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so now that we've kind of discussed your efforts in building a really successful uh, investment management firm, can you explain uh, your decision to buy the Milwaukee Bucks from an investment perspective? And kind of like what made you realize that you wanted to buy the Milwaukee Bucks? Um, well, I loved basketball. So um, I always wanted to, if I could get involved. So I started getting involved in basketball by buying limited partnership interests. So I got involved in, uh, at the time, uh, the New Jersey Nets. So bought, um, bought a piece of the Nets and ended up, um, when the Nets became available, when they moved to Brooklyn, 
um, got involved in bidding against uh, Prokhorov, who was the previous owner. Um, and I got outbid by 100 million. And what you learn, and what I learned in that process was uh, at the time, the Nets were losing about 10 million a year. And I thought bidding 350 for a team that was losing 10 million a year was a lot of money. Um, Prokhorov thought 450 was a good number. <laughs> I don't know how you come up with 450. Um, so got outbid. And then when Milwaukee became available, um, the team was making about $5 million a year. So we looked at it, um, and the highest bid next to us was four fifty, And we ended up uh, bidding five fifty, um, so roughly about 100 times. And the reason we paid 550 is um, at the time, Senator Cole, who was the seller, said that was the number. And no matter how many times I would meet with him and explain, but why would we pay 100 million more than the next highest bid? Because, because if you want the team, that's the cost. And you sort of find out in sports, um, you can have an economic reason, but you're going to find that if you want to buy it, someone has a price, and that's the price. So originally, when we were buying the team, we thought um, you had your TV contract was coming up. The, they come up every nine years. So we thought that at the time it was $900 million. We thought it'd be, uh, it was $900 million per year. Um, there's 30 teams, so each team got $30 million. We thought you'd end up that that number would double. And if it did... Um, you know, within a two years, we thought we'd be able to pretty much pay 550. We thought team would be 750. Um, we'd make a couple hundred million on the team and then sell the team. Mm. We were wrong. Uh, the TV contract was triple, mm. so that was good news. The value of the team shot up to a billion dollars, so that was better news. And we found we loved it so much that you didn't want to sell. Um, so what became sort of a financial play stopped, and you sort of find um, it's, it's, an, it's something that you love doing. It became an asset that you believed was going to continue to grow. I think today, you know, the team's probably valued somewhere between two, two and a half. Um, and it makes the same $5 million. So why is that? Right? It's, I think you just have more people who want to own sports. Um, and what you find out about owning a sports team um, is that you, you actually don't focus. It's totally the reverse of owning any company or being involved in an investment. Your, your goal is to win as opposed to make money. So the team, our team, could make 40 million plus a year. But if we did that, you wouldn't have Giannis, you wouldn't have the players that we have. So you've got to decide, is the focus to win or is the focus to make money? And I think for the majority of people, the focus is to win. Um, you're going to see the Warriors this year, I think I'll probably pay in excess of 200 million in the luxury tax. And so why is that? Because they want to keep winning. And sort of the cost of winning is expensive, but I think the value of your franchise continues to move up. So are you guys Sixers fans here? Yeah, so I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> right, you guys are now what, 0-2? Yeah, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Undefeated. Right, and undefeated. We're, undefe we're undefeated. Um, so, now think about that. There's 82 games, and right now Philly is depressed <laughs> because they're 0 and 2. Right, and it, it's just, it becomes very emotional. And we, on the other hand, after winning yesterday, 
you know, you go in the locker room and everybody's like, yeah, undefeated season. You're like, no, we've got another <laughs> 81 games. But it's, you know, the great thing about sports is um, you, you live through it and there's a real passion and it's a little bit of what you were talking about earlier. It really is a passion. And, and because of that passion, people are extremely invested in it. Um, and it becomes a big part of their lives and you, you get involved in it. You know, when I bought the team, the, you, you're walking around the stadium and, you know, in Milwaukee, it's very different than Philly. You know, you guys are a little uh, emotional. Um, <laughs> That's one way to put it. That's right? one way to put Is it. That one way, like, you get a little emotional about things. So, um, you know, somebody came up to me <laughs> and, um, you know, we're sitting in our seats and he goes, excuse me, Mr. Lassery, can I ask you a quick question? I go, yeah. He goes, would you mind taking some advice about what you could do with the team? And we were the worst team when we bought the team. We were the worst team in the league. I go, absolutely. What would you like? And he goes, I think it would help if you get LeBron and Steph on this team. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, thank you. It's a great <laughs> idea. He goes, it's the least we could do. And, you know, and he goes back to his seat. <laughs> All right. How do you think somebody would say that to the owner of the Sixers? Like, to, here's what you got to do. <laughs> you, know, you guys are crazy. <laughs> so you mentioned just winning and obviously every single sport team just wants to win and you did that in 2021 uh you brought a championship back to milwaukee but prior to that the bucks haven't won uh a championship since 1971 like almost over yeah 50 years ago so what were the things that you did as an owner uh to bring back like a winning culture to milwaukee you know it's a great question it really is because the one thing you find when you buy a team is you have to sort of deal with one big issue. And the issue is do you create a team or do you get the best players in the hope that they will end up winning, right? So I think Brooklyn has gone down the road of we're going to get, you know, we're going to get the best players. So they had, uh, you know, they had Durant, they have Kyrie and the, you know, they had Harden. And so they went down that road. We went down the road of, we want to have a team. And we want people who are going to sacrifice for the common good. And look, it all sounds great. It really does. But <laughs> it's really hard to do. It's really hard to get people to sort of buy into that. And you've got to sort of get the players that will buy into that. right? And your GM is constantly trying to get the best players. Um, but one of the mandates we gave them was, look, we want, really, we want to try to have talented players who believe in a team as opposed to with themselves. And that's really hard to do. It really is. And I think, we, I think our general manager did a great job. But you can see... You know, we made, you make a bunch of mistakes because you're trying to find the right mix that works. And it helps, you know, that you have Giannis and you have one of the best players in the NBA. But at the same time, you need to sort of form that team. Um, and I think our GM did a great job with that. And we sort of saw it as we were going down, you know, that road. Um, you know, a team sort of even though we were down 2-0 um, against, uh, you know, the Suns, the team didn't panic. And even though, you know, we ended up playing the seventh game in Brooklyn um, against the Nets and we go into overtime, you sort of saw that it was a team effort. And... I know it sounds hokey, but it really ends up being that. Um, and I think sort of we made decision, we want a team. And, um, you know, I think last year we would have probably gotten to the NBA Finals if Chris hadn't gotten hurt. Um, and this year, you know, I think we're one of two teams favored. But the NBA is really about if people stay healthy, right? And if we stay healthy, we should win. 
And if we don't, you know, we'll have issues. So uh, can you talk about the experience of being in game seven in Brooklyn against the Nets? Like, what was it like being there? Uh, the atmosphere afterwards, can you just talk a little bit about sure. that? Um, you know, it's a bit surreal. I mean, obviously, um, you live, you, you, you have these massive highs and massive lows. Right. So the massive low was, I think it was game two in Brooklyn. I think we lost by like 40 points. And I remember I went back in the locker room talking to our coach. I'm like, seriously? <laughs> like 40 points? He goes, Mark, it was just a bad game. I go, yeah, no fucking kidding. It was a bad <laughs> game. <laughs> like... How did we lose by 40? It's like, it's complicated. I go, it's not that complicated. <laughs> and you sort of have these lows of, all right. And you know, I always love coaches because it's like, don't worry about it. Series doesn't start until we play at home. You know, we're, we just got to hold our own and we'll be fine. I go, we just lost by 40. And you're excited that we're playing at home? He goes, don't worry. Once we get home, it'll be fine. All right, so what, whatever, we tied up. Now you get to the seventh game. And it's, it was, I mean, it was a real nail biter. You're going back and forth. Um, and so we're up two. And Durant's got the ball. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm sitting courtside with my son. And he's about to shoot. And I look away. Because I'm thinking, yeah, you know, I, I can't watch because you see him shooting a three. So I look away. So if the basket's there, I look this way. And I figure I'll know by the sound of the fans. Right? If they cheer, it went in. And really what you're waiting for is the, you know, you've done that, right? When somebody misses, you suck. <laughs> Whatever it is. And I'm waiting and, all I, and I'm looking this way and all I hear is, and I'm like, what? <laughs> and now I look back and I see he's behind the three-point line. And I'm asking my son, is it a three? Is it a two? And he's like, I think it's a two. And, you know, you have to wait. And then, thank God, it was a two. Um, now you got to go into overtime. So does anybody know what the score of the overtime was? It was four to two. Five minutes, four to two. I mean, they score first. We score, then it just goes back and forth. Everybody was exhausted because people weren't coming out. Um, then we score, and we win four to, I mean, you know, you win four to two in the overtime. Um, it was a surreal feeling. It was great. I mean, it's, you know, everybody was excited. Um, I went out afterwards in Brooklyn with my, uh, my sons, we were walking to the car, but then there was a local bar. We go in, and we've all got wearing our Bucks jerseys. Didn't realize people had flown in from Milwaukee to see the game. So that night cost me a fortune because I bought the whole bar drinks. I don't know <laughs> <laughs> there was Nets fans, and I felt bad, so I bought them a drink. <laughs> so it's just you know everybody was drinking, so I figured it was easier for everybody to get drunk, and we'd all have a good time. Um, but yeah, it, it was surreal. Yeah, I think that's a great way to put it. Um, so you co-own the Bucks with Wes Edens, Jamie Dinan, and Mike Facitelli, all of whom run very successful uh, investment managers. Can you talk a little bit about the dynamic of this partnership and what makes this work? It, it's hard. I mean, it is, because everybody's got an opinion. And it's, um, I think ultimately the good news is we all respect each other's opinions. Um, and sort of the way a partnership works is we vote on things. And um, I'd say we, you know, 95% of the time we agree, right? And when we don't, you'll sort of vote on it. But it, it's worked out well. I think part of it is all of us want to have we all want to win, so we get it. We know what it's like to run a big business. 
and um, it, it's actually been a very nice partnership. Great. Um, so any words of advice that we didn't touch on that you would think would be really helpful for all of us students sitting here uh, as we start our careers in both business and sports? Yeah. Um, look, I think it's, I think the one thing for all of you, um, you know, somebody had told me this when I got started, it's, I'm sure everybody tells you the same thing and then you sort of listen to it and go, yeah. You know, hard work really is a prerequisite to success. It just is. You know, it's, um, I don't know what your generation is like in the sense of um, y you've got to put in the time. And by putting in the time, um, you will, things just happen. You bump into people because you're working hard. Somebody else is working hard. Things happen. Um, I would tell you, I think you should all take acting classes. Mm -hmm. um, I'm serious. And the reason is um, your generation is much more about texting. Um, you don't, I, I think you communicate, you don't communicate as well. Acting enables your public speaking. Because you're going to be in situations where you're going to have to make presentations. You're going to have to do things. Um, it's hard. And you, if you want to have an edge over your fellow students or your fellow workers, um, I, here's the thing. I can't make anybody in this room smarter. Right? You all think you're smart anyway. But I can't make you smarter. You are what you are. I can make you better read. I can make I, I, I can, you know, you can read more, you can understand things, but ultimately your level of intelligence is where it is. What I can make you is a better public speaker. I can make you more personable, right? Or you can make yourself more personable. And I think at the end of the day, what you want is since you're competing against, you know, sort of the best of the best, how do you, how do, you do that? I would say try to be better read and try to be more outgoing or more personable, which is by sort of doing public speaking, which is by doing acting. Um, because ultimately, you're going to end up competing against people who are doing that. And it depends on how you want to sort of define success. But when I sort of look at the people in our business who've done exceptionally well. It's people who are very smart, but also people who can explain things in a simple way. Right? And if you sort of think about that, in life you've got marketing people, so street smart people, and you've got book smart or analytical people. Right? The analytical people always say, God, that guy's an idiot. Right? The marketing guy, because he doesn't understand anything. The marketing guy goes, well, that guy's an idiot. I have no idea what he just said. <laughs> and if you sort of think about that, that's, that's what's going on. If you can do both, if you can be that person and do both, you're going to do really, really well in any endeavor that you try. So figure out what your weakness is or what your lack of. If, if you're more of a marketing person, that's great then become better read. If you're more of a book smart person, take public speaking, take acting, so that you're better with people. Thank you so much. Uh, I think we have about 10 minutes left for a Q&A from the crowd. Sure. Go ahead. Can we pass the... Just say your name and... Sorry. Awesome. Oh, thanks. I'm Mark. My name is Nazar. I'm a second year MBA at Wharton. Actually, uh, I'm writing a thesis in the field of sports, this kind of shift into private ownership groups. Um, just curious yourself, being a part owner of the Milwaukee 
uh, bucks, except as I think an individual rather than through Avenue. I just wondering if you've kind of noticed this kind of emergence of, you know, say clearly capital going into different ownerships and just to see if like that has changed at all the management in your eyes compared to like how you and your group manage the Milwaukee bucks. Look, it's a great question. I think there is a shift that's happening, right? And, and part of that is just the cost of these teams. So when we bought the team, think about it, it was seven years ago, eight years ago. We were the worst team in the league and we paid 550, which was the most anybody had ever paid. That's a lot of money and I'm not saying it's not, but you, you could come up with that from a personal standpoint. Today, you'd have to put up two and a half billion and you saw that the Broncos sold, I think, for four and a half billion. So the pool of people who can buy a team is going down just because the cost is going up. And sort of the way that you get around it is by sort of having institutions now get more involved. So you sort of saw it with uh, Manchester City um, where sort of the Sovereign Wealth Fund of Abu Dhabi ends up getting involved. You're, I think it was, uh, I think it's Newcastle got bought by the Saudi family. So you're going to see more institutions. And right now you've got a group Dial and Arctos and all these different groups out there that want to buy interest in, in teams. Um, I think you're going to see over the next five years that you'll have more institutional buyers or partnerships, private equity, that'll come in. Um, just because the cost has become much more expensive. So it's, it's just harder, right? So I think, I think you're going down, you know, if you, that's what you're running your thesis on. Um, I think um, you're where you're at Wharton right now, or? Yeah, right. Um, it'll, it'll end up being something that people will cite. So it's actually, it's a really good idea. You can become the expert in that field. Yeah, why not, right? Go for it. Sure. Uh, my name is Ali, um, second year grad at Temple University. I was curious in terms of the technical basketball aspect, and I don't know much about basketball, I'm more of a soccer guy, but you mentioned taking the Milwaukee Bucks as the worst team in the NBA and improving them as well as becoming champions. I was interested in the process of building up, uh, not necessarily the squad, but more of the technical staff. Do you take any of that decision in terms of any of those decisions with the head coach in terms of um, how your technical staff is going to look like, the role of analytics in, in your squad building or your decision making tactically or uh, whatever else it is that, you know, builds up to the success of the team on the field. So it is. So there was no analytics department when we bought the team. So, you know, one of the first things we did was create an analytics team. Um, you ended up increasing your scouting. You ended up just being more methodical about things. So we went from sort of four coaches to seven coaches, assistant coaches. Um, it, it is a lot of the little things you're talking about, whether it is soccer or whether it's basketball. Um, your focus and what you're trying to do is sort of, um, you'll explain to one of the players, look, from this spot, you shoot 70%. So you want to get to this spot in the game because there's a higher probability you're going to make it, right? That's, so that actually makes a lot of sense except for one thing. The player always says to you, yeah, I know I can score from there. Everybody knows I can score from there. I got to go somewhere else where they're not expecting me to go, right? And you're like, no, not really, actually... <laughs> You're scoring 70% of the time from here. Why not just keep doing that? And the player will say, no, I have to get better. I have to do things that I'm not as good at to become more well-rounded. 
and we go, no, no, seriously, so this is the spot. Let me show it to you. And this is what you got to do. And <coughs> part of that is y you, you are trying to impress on people, hey, here's what the numbers show you. And they intuitively they know it, but what they what players want to do is always work on things that they're not good at, right? And I think one of the things we've tried to do is sort of explain, focus on what you're really, really good at. Because, you know, I had gone, and, you know, this was hammered into me. Um, when I was like 35, 36, um, I went to Michael Jordan's basketball camp. And you pay 15000 you have a great time, and it's 100 people. And you go and um, because I got picked to play Jordan one on one. I mean, we all know how it ended. <laughs> I felt bad for Michael that he lost. Uh, <laughs> but you playing one on one, and Jordan had this great thing. He would just say, "Go stand over there." I go, "Why?" He goes, "That's where I'm going to shoot from." And I'm like, "Okay." And he goes, "That's where I made the most of my points." Everybody knew that. They couldn't stop it. And he goes, you go stand there. And you go there. And he goes, you might want to jump after I jump because you'll be coming down while I'm still going up. <laughs> and it didn't make a difference. Everybody, you know, there were 10 guys who tried it. Like you knew exactly where he was going to go. It made no difference. There's nothing you could do. And I'm of the belief if you're that good, and everybody knows what you're going to do, and you still are doing it, keep doing it. And that's what we keep trying to like tell Giannis. Like, you're really good at driving to the basket. Do that. Or, and you show this to all the players, and I think they're getting there, but that was one of the big things we started doing, if that's helpful. Yeah, you guys. Keep... Yeah. We have time for about one more question. Oh, sorry. Oh, we do? Good. Wow. Go ahead. Yay. We're go, go crazy. Oh, wait. We're actually done. Oh, we're actually <laughs> Sorry. done. Sorry. Was it a good question? <laughs> was it a phenomenal question? It was pretty good. Go for it. I want, yeah, I want players to play. At the end of the day, you, know, you want people to play. I think fans want the players to play. Um, and it, it is, you're going back and forth. You don't want anybody playing who's hurt, but you want people playing. So you'll see that that's going to become a bigger and bigger issue in the NBA. I don't disagree with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's absolutely amazing.